This podcast is brought to you by the School of Advanced Study, University of London. Um, and besides Germanic and Romance literature, her interests include early modern visual culture and uh, the interplay of early printed texts and images. She's also into witchcraft and early modern herbals, she tells me. Depictions of. Depictions of. <laughs> <laughs> right. Um, and she has published a monograph on the representation of physical pain in early modern imagery and discourse, and also a book chapter on the iconography of the witch. Um, so without further ado, um, Andrea's paper is entitled English Comedians in Germany in the Early Modern Period. Um, this paper concerns itself in the widest sense with the changing forms of comedy and entertainment that was connected with the travelling actors of the late 16th century in the narrow sense. It's, um, uh, with the introduction of a new form of stage clowning that drove the move from reciting to improvisation. The example I chose is a character called Pickelhering, who remained the favorite of German comedy in the world into the 18th century. But the initial... Excuse me. Well, I want to just... Um, but the initial inspiration... Sorry, uh, <laughs> <laughs> For this contribution came from an annual German cultural exchange, namely, namely the office library in the library. I'm the librarian for all Western European languages in Sanitizer Library, and I share an office with the English Studies Librarian, which had asked me and occasionally the question, what did your country's literature ever do for us? Does it pop up? <laughs> and during one of these dissections of German humor, uh, I'm so wary so, <clears throat> I grandly announced that it had been the English comedians in the 1590s who had given the Germans a taste for clowns and that music hall humor with a strong focus on comestibles and tight-fitting poses. A taste that would go out of fashion during the Enlightenment, or arguably even never went out of fashion, given my love for declaring that the worst is yet to come. I also announced that the theatrical repertoire of these English actor comedians had been central to the founding of the gender in the German stage. But when asked to provide more details, I was stumped. However, I soon found that for those interested in the subject of the English comedians in early modern Germany, or in transnational exchange in early modern theatre, or the Nazi appropriation of Shakespeare, or Friedrich Gundolf's disparagement of the English comedians in his Shakespeare and the Deutsche Geist, that the Germanic, I don't know what's wrong with my voice, uh, I sound pain, um, <coughs> uh, in his Shakespeare and the Deutsche Geist, that the um, Germanic Studies Library and the extensive collections of Senate House Libraries, uh, British literature and Western European languages is uh, offers a probably unrivaled resource for the curious, the most wonderful one-stop shop for all things Shakespearean studies. So I'm not an expert on this subject, but as soon as my suggestion had been um, accepted by this panel and the program had been publicized, I received a kind email from a gentleman expert on the subject, George Opis Trotman, who said he would be in the audience today, but I'm not sure if he's here. Um, so who were these English comedians? The Renaissance in Europe saw not only scientific and cultural advance, but also changing forms of entertainment, both for the masses and for the elite. Um, so one form of entertainment catered for both elite and masses, and these were the traveling troops of English comedians in Germany in the late 16th century. Aristocratic amusement entailed that the nobility commissioned artisans to entertain them. The merchant merrymen of the middle classes would occasionally include the theatre, but the mainstay of entertainment consisted of blood sports such as bear baiting, bull baiting, dog fights, cock fights, and attending quacks performances and the like. The poor could rarely afford such diversions as the theatre, generally having to stand as groundlings, but could seek entertainment at public executions, public humiliations, carnival, <coughs> which and water trials and other reasons for which no fee was charged. The only form of entertainment, as I said, that catered for all classes were the travelling troops. Uh, so troops of English actors, comedians, first crossed the channel to try their luck in Europe in the 1580s, and by the start of the Thirty Years' War in 1618, they had mostly returned to England. And by the time peace, or relative peace, returned to those, uh, returned, those traveling troops had still styled themselves English, 
were only English and so far that they included actors who had worked with English actors or included actors that had been trained by English actors. We can only speculate as to what their exact motives were, but we can mention a number of motives, or possible motives. There's money. The travelling actors were better paid and then they were uh, paid back in England. And so you see this quote from Thomas Decker. Um, and London had seen the opening of the, the theatre in 1576, the Curtain in 1577, and the Rose in 1587, and a new breed of professional players had sprung up in at least recent London. Due to growing competition at home, some groups crossed over to the continent where they achieved lasting fame, in this paper, under the catch-all term in English Comedian, due to this name was given to them in a pirated publication in 1620. But comedianten or comedians meant at that time actors rather than comedians in the now English sense. 1592 had also seen the closure of the theatres in London due to the plague, which forced the actors on the road as well as increased, and they also saw increased censorship through the Master of Rebels, and there's one of those uh, regulations, which regulated their repertoire and actively excluded all matters religious and political from the stage. Becoming a strolling player on the continent also had the additional freedom from the very demanding repertoire of plays, as their style was performative rather than a recital. It should also not be forgotten that the common players were legally classified within the lowest staff of societies, uh, society as rogues, vagabonds and still beggars in this, like in this act of 1572, and most European states vigorously enforced similar legislation. So the cultural interaction between England and the strife-torn empire of the German-speaking states had previously seen a flow of ideas from Germany to England during the Reformation. But as the 16th century came to a close and saw the rise of the Tudor dynasty, the blossoming of the city of London and the emergence of a trading nation, the northern Protestants looked more and more to England for inspiration and leadership. The emerging merchant adventurer provided the template for the English player who would successfully market his wares just like the merchant adventurer. Uh, the German stage had already undergone a change during the middle of the 15th century with the introduction of the scenic stage which had been developed in Italy and similarly the Italian players of the Commedia dell'arte had enjoyed great popularity in Germany and their characters featured masked and half-masked characters such as Hanukino, Pantalone and the Dottore and also unmasked characters. These were instantly identifiable by their costumes and attributes. And these performers worked their way through ever renewed scenarios and different combinations of familiar plot lines. Um, I'm just not doing um, but the, the one on the right, the fresco, is uh, a 16th century fresco that can still be visited in Germany and uh, in southern Germany and uh, pays a testament to their tremendous popularity. Um, these early modern theater, uh, the early modern theater offered the spectator a much wider range of spectacle than we now associate with theater. Groups of traveling players were expected to stage shows which combined music with dancing as well as clowning, acrobatics and other stage business, including the selling of medicines, the curing of ailments and the pulling of teeth amongst other things. This close connection between the medical practitioner, quack, and the early theater is easily forgotten. The non-verbal elements of the English comedians were hugely popular with paying audiences, both in public and in court, and these non-verbal elements were crucial to the commercial success of these English comedians. Their initial performing style, which was based on comic jigs of the type, increasingly of the type which had become increasingly marginalized on English stages, is wonderfully summarized as musical, clown-centered um, form of performing by M.A. Patrinsky. Um, in addition to selling medicines and other goods and services, the English players pursued non-medical commercial interests, dealing in anything from arms, metal, cloth, a cloth, luxury goods or musical instruments and livestock, as well as the importation and training of English performers, whether boys or adults, which I headed under clan trafficking, but uh, haven't developed it. Performers offered spectacles of an acrobatic or otherwise non-literary nature, which would later be, re <coughs> be replaced by comedies, tragedies, and plays. But in the first decades, the most important non-scripted element was the play of the clown, and the most successful clown of the English players was Pickenhearing. Pickenhearing probably got his name from those herrings that are not salted, but pickled, 
and these pickled kippers are called walking in Dutch, and in German they are Brückling, and they were a traditional and fair. Bickelhering became the most successful clown uh, of the German stage, and his uh, reception on the whole was uh, very enthusiastic. However, we have the report of a contemporary Englishman who was not as amused as his German counterpart by Pickelhering and his antics. Heinz Morrison, uh, had spent most of the 1590s traveling on the European continent and the Eastern Mediterranean. He wrote about his travels in his multi-volume itinerary, an interesting work also of value for social historians, as a picture of the social conditions in the lands he visited emerges very strongly from his, um, uh, from his reports. And in 1591 he traveled around continental Europe for the specific purpose of observing local customs, institutions and economics. He took his written notes, and uh, perhaps no portion of his itinerary has roused more interest than his brief passage about the so-called comedians, whom he saw at the Frankfurt Fair in September 1592. It is of particular interest, uh, as it is from an English source, and by someone with previous acquaintance with the Theatre of London, which allowed him to judge the respective merits of English performers. In contrast to Morrison, we are fortunate to to have access to the correspondence between Balthasar and Magdalena Baumgartner, the very wealthy to Nuremberg couple whose letters concern every aspect of their life from the management of their mercantile ventures through intimate details of their family life. And so in 1592, Balthasar writes to Magdalena about seeing the English comedians and he's very enthusiastic and his positive impressions provide an interesting contrast to Morrison's comments. And Morrison's, in addition, also displayed a veritable mania for recording prices, price of everything, and thus allowed later commentators uh, to estimate that the players gave an average of 180 performances annually with a company of 15 and an attendance of 500. So if they all shared the total earnings of 300 thousands equally, so one uh, commentator is quoted, uh, they, between them, would have shared the considerable fortune. So, uh, in contrast, you probably want to buy a stunner picture of Pickle here, because in contrast to the immense visual record and well-documented images of the Comedia dell'Arte, the rarity of accepted images associated with the activities of the English players in Europe is striking, but I would not go as far as some scholars do, agreeing with them that there is an iconographic blackout. Katritsky has examined the possibility that certain paintings by Franz Hals include portraits of the English drawing artists in the picking here. Hals had a proven interest in depicting performing marginals and he had ample opportunity to observe and meet the English players in his first work place Antwerp and later in Harlem, his home from 1600 onward. And, um, so these images show, uh, and also this one was a bit cut off, but it at least says that he is the zoo picking living. Uh, show images of the vital figure of Pickenhering, who became synonymous with laughter and personified the physical and material side of life, and who was the fool not just during the joyous carnival season, but all the time. We know that Pickenhering continued to star not only in full length plays, but also in comic afterpieces. These would later include Faust travesties and uh, Gruppius Peter Swens of 1658, as well as English based jigs, around, uh, such as Pickenhering in the Kiste. Uh, I the other one. Uh, he was the embodiment of the licensed school, wearing a multicolored outfit in the colors of yellow and red, and in, at his time, yellow being the color of contempt and shame, and the color of the other, such as rogues, Jews, couples, prostitutes, and foreigners, and red, the color of sexuality. So Pickelheng was particularly partial to trousers with alternating colors, much like the outfit of the public execution of the ultimate other. Um, during his during Pickling's time, Dutch playwrights felt so economically threatened by the extent and success of the activities of the popular English players that the Dutch poet and playwright Predero felt compelled to admonish the local Amsterdam women for, for deserting his, his plays in favor of those of the visiting English players and priests and theologians, and, one, uh, and theologians warned their parishioners against going to see the professional players. So, this is a, a very confusing image of Peter Cornelius van der Morsch in his role. He was a, a player, 
he was part of a, a club of rhetoricians, but he's in his road with shown as Pierre at the stage three, reading a clipper. So um, art historians will have to do a lot of work on Peter Lien to, to explain the iconography of this image. So, when in um, 1620 and in 1624, finally pirated versions of the English troops' playtests, uh, many featuring pickle herring, were published, it only helped pickle herring to gain further popularity, and it established his stage name as the most popular stage character of the English troops in Germany. The two last images, pickle herring. Uh, show how Peter Herring managed to enter the popular imagination as the figure is used in a popular pamphlet of 1620 to show how Peter Herring is on his way to Prague to profit from uh, religious strife and iconoclasm by wishing to sell pickaxes to the Protestants to deface the altars. However, the joke is really on Peter Herring as the political tide has turned, of which the, the, the audience of this pamphlet will have been aware of. Uh, but Peter Herring is of course not aware of the um, so to come to the end, I hope the question of what Peter Herring ever did for the literature of Germany is beginning to be answered. The English comedians brought a new performing style to the Germans, a style that ultimately was absorbed into German theatre long before Peter Herring's and Hans Wurst's autodacta and trial and the subsequent burning of the puppet of uh, Peter Herring or Hans Wurst at the hands of Karoline Neuber in 1737. So Peter Herring needs to be thanked. And Thank you too. Thank you very much, Andrea. And uh, our next speaker is uh, Nicole Bayard. She's the director of French studies at the University of Leicester. Um, her research focuses on 20th century and contemporary French theatre. In particular, on the history and politics of performance, translation, and adaptation of Shakespeare in France. Very pertinent to our topic. Um, and uh, she particularly looks at these things with reference to cultural memory and transnational identities. Are we up and running gradually? Mm -hmm. Okay, good. Um, Nicole is the author of um, The Performance of Shakespeare in France Since the Second World War, Reimagining Shakespeare, that was in 2006, that was published, um, as well as numerous, numerous articles in the field. Um, Nicole also participates in the European research program Shakespeare in the Making of Europe, which could be very interesting to several people in the room, um, and this project brings together scholars from seven universities in the Netherlands, the UK, Germany and Poland, and of course title today, it coincides with the PowerPoint, how good is that, um, is Inside and Outside Shakespeare as the Urban Spaceman, Shakespearean Comedy and Displacement in France. Good afternoon. Uh, I've slashed through my introduction, so if you can bear with me, that'd be great. Um, can you hear me without the microphone? Yeah, great. Um, okay. Uh, so, um, what I'm going to look at today is uh, adaptations uh, of uh, Shakespeare's born out of experimentations dating back to the 1960s and 70s. And um, during this period, politically aware theatre practitioners in France were actively calling for radical definitions of art and culture, free from state ideological uh, control. And they were asking questions such as, what, uh, uh, I said in French for comic effect, pourquoi faisons-nous ce que nous faisons? Pourquoi le faisons-nous dans le cadre d'une institution, au lieu de briser cette institution, la culture a-t-elle encore un sens Their aim was to step up the democratic role of the theatre and break down the cultural and social boundaries between the stage and the audience in order, they claim, to speak to the spectators directly. Now, the anti-establishment desire to transgress aesthetic and cultural boundaries inspired by Guy Debord and the Situationists 
led to attempt to create alternative performance spaces and proactive concepts of culture based on its usefulness to expose social injustices and instill revolutionary passions. So we're very much uh, within the 1960s and the 70s here, and the 1960s thinking in France that led to the cultural revolution of 1968. Now, out of this movement was born collaborative performance, but also street theatre, which really took off in France uh, at that time. And street theatre companies uh, reject familiar sites, such as bill theatre, as well as formal text, and therefore this causes them to perform in unexpected public spaces, such as markets, supermarkets, streets, village squares, or empty factories, to name but a few. So, in this paper, what I'd like to do is to examine two productions of Shakespearean comedies performed in France over the past 10 years by French street companies. And the questions I shall ask are whether taking the theatre into urban space, but out of familiar environments, and especially out of the familiar environment of the theatre, of the built theatre, uh, in these productions, had any aesthetic ideological effect, or ideological effect on Shakespearean comedies, and whether it's possible to argue that Shakespeare as comic urban spaceman, as it were, transforms the performance space into a participatory space, which might help to redefine notions of citizenship. So, to begin with, I'm going to briefly contextualize Shakespearean comedy within theories of spatial, spatial citizenship. In Citizen Shakespeare, Freeman and Aliens in the language of the plays, John Archer demonstrates the prominent role played by Shakespearean comedy in highlighting the systems of identity formation in the context of urban life. For Archer, the content and the language of Shakespeare's comedies reflects 16th century power structures based on urban citizenship rather than class domination. He demonstrates that possession of the status of urban citizen or non-citizen determine the inclusion and the exclusion of Londoners from economic participation. And Archer concludes that Shakespearean comedy has to be regarded as dealing with identity formation defined in relation to the principle of antagonism, such as the figure of the foreigner and the alien. And he says that this is staged topographically through the main trope of displacement, such as transposing the city to the forest, as in Midsummer Night's Dream, for example, uh, or as you like it or introducing outsiders into the community and highlighting the anxieties that these disturbances, disturbances to the peace produce. Now, the link between citizenship and displacement is a recurrent theme in political analysis of citizenship. The notion of citizenship is based on symbolic constructions of, real and of both real and symbolic borders to bring together and to divide constituting, constituting, constituting uh, an inside and an outside. Um, Etienne Balibar, for example, has shown that while the primary function of the border is to keep people either in or out, it also serves as a trope of dislocation, and I will dislocate, dislocation, and inversion in order to produce the stranger or the, foreign, or the foreigner as a social type. In the 60s, in a context of growing mobilization against the exclusion of workers and immigrants for, from urban space, French philosopher Henri Lefebvre called for a reconceptualization of citizenship framed within the right to the city as a rejection of discriminatory social organization. At the height of Marxism, Lefebvre substituted everyday life for the workplace as the primary locus of exploitation, domination and struggle. And his message was that all social relations uh, become real and concrete only when they are spatially inscribed. And that means concretely represented within concrete space. So inscribed in the production of social space. 
So in the third reconfiguration of urban citizenship, citizens appropriate social space through everyday practices, such as work, housing, leisure, artistic uh, practices, going to the theatre. And this politically charged space, therefore, integrates and gives visibility to hitherto peripheralized and marginalized subjects wherever these are located. And this enables citizens uh, to, and, and practitioners to affirm new social relations and opportunities for new political struggles. So following the fair, in the 70s, artists defined street theatre and happening as a space where social relations can be redefined. Traditional theatres, as we've all experienced, establish boundaries between the stage and the auditorium. And the performance is accepted as an aesthetic activity with boundaries between fiction and the so-called reality. For Michel Simino, Street performance radically differs from these familiar sites in the sense that it changes the dynamics between place, context, and participants. Street performance blurs the boundaries between the places where the daily activities of the spectator takes place and where aesthetic activities take place. The performance space is displaced, therefore, into the space of everyday practices. And I would also add that it includes within the performance space spectators from multiple backgrounds without exclusions, including some who would never go to theatre, which is, after all, what street theatre artists more specifically were seeking at that time. And, and, and current st uh, street theatre artists want to achieve. So, drawing on these theories, I, I'm going to explore next whether intervening spatially on the notion of the inside and the outside in Shakespearean comedy encourages a different side of civic participation. So, I'm going to start with the company, uh, a French company called Vinci Mille Couverts, um, which in 2007 inaugurated the Chalon dans la Rue Street Fiesta Festival with, with uh, much ado about nothing. Now, this production toured for seven years, achieving 300 performances in the period. Vinci Mille Couverts is a street theatre uh, company based in Dijon, in the, the east of France, and was originally founded in 1995 by director Philippe Nicole. The company is known from pri for privileging the unexpected, and they say they envision the theatre as a utopia and they're renowned for playing tricks on spectators. And if you bear this at the back of your mind, that would be very useful. Mm -hmm. So it's not surprising that they chose to perform Much Ado About Nothing, which, as you know, is a play which, whose main themes include many examples of deception, self-deception, masks, mistaken identity, but also inclusions and exclusions as follows. Um, much ado, in, in Much Ado, real and symbolic war plots or struggle plots introduce the inclusion of foreign guests and political and matrimonial alliances within the city of Messina. As Don Pedro's illegitimate brother, the plotter Don John symbolizes the untrustworthy nature of the outsider. And citizenship is also shown to be bound up with sovereignty. For example, urban and political stability are restored by Leonato, Prince of Messina, Messina's civil representatives, such as the Watch and Dogberry. The role of the constables is to enforce the prince's order and to apprehend delinquents and vagabonds. Should these representatives fail, they also tarnish the reputation of the sovereign, as illustrated by Don Pedro's taking the blame for the Watch and Dogberry's ineptness. Non-belonging is tied up with banishment from the city. So Don, Don John escapes from the Messina when the plot is uncovered and is subsequently excluded from the play. The production program announced a highly sophisticated modern adaptation of the play according to the claim in the program a so-called Enfüldung, a Brechten Enfüldung. Now I've checked, apparently in German the term Enfüldung doesn't exist, is that correct? Enfüldung, is that German? Enfüldung, maybe? 
I wasn't filled with a new umlaut, so I don't think it exists. I remember tricks, okay? Um, and also with, so this is what, what they, they, they said, but what, what, this is what was printed in Pro. Okay, so this is very important, okay, so you really want to read this very carefully, okay? So this is what they announced, and this is also what they promised the play was going to be about, okay? We, we also with projections of war images, so there were correspondences with Iraq and Afghanistan, and very, very impressive. Um, and, they, and they also claimed that they were going to present the stage like a bunker. Okay. All approaches that really contrast widely with the company's usual approach, because after all, we're talking about a street theatre company, and, and the press was really surprised, and was, and you had headlines saying that Vincent is, 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 for the very first time, is going back into the theatre. Okay, so this is actually what happened. On arrival, uh, when the audience came to the theatre, the, the door was closed. And a technical problem was alleged, and we were asked to wait at the entrance. 20 minutes later, an alarm sound went off. 20 minutes later, okay? An alarm sound went off, and a theatre employee, a so-called theatre employee, actually an actor, called out that for reasons of health and safety, the show was cancelled. <laughs> And she said that the stage manager <coughs> explained the problem, but for some reason uh, he was delayed. So some people in the audience complained loudly about ineptness. Now there's not really a bell, ineptness, doctor, watch, pen. And they asked for their money back. And other people were really angry and they left grumbling to the belly. And after a while, so we, we were, we were, again, we were outside, okay, and uh, the, the rest of us who were there, well, actually, we watched an improvised performance in the car park at the back of the theatre, and it was wonderful. However, we all sworn to secrecy, so I can't tell you it was mine, okay, and it's toured for seven years, okay, but the audience has been sworn to secrecy, and nothing has leaked on the internet, okay, fantastic. Okay, so a brief analysis of what went on here enables us to conclude that despite appearances, I actually think that the main focus of the performance was on much ado about nothing, but not on the plot, obviously. Okay, maybe with the title of the play being taken literally. In our daily lives, we take rules and boundaries, symbols of belonging and exclusion at face value. A little like the spectators who excluded themselves from the performance on being refused admission to the theatre building. Vincent Couvert asks us maybe what the fuss is about. Did nothing happen? What is nothing? Something happened with part of the performance, and it was brilliant. Is the fuss about Shakespeare's play? Is it about what going to the theatre is about? Is it about the theatre itself? Because although Shakespeare's play, as we know it, wasn't performed, can we really say that this version of Much Ado was totally insignificant? Now, importantly, Vincent Couvert's Much Ado reversed the opposition inside, outside, and abolished the division between stage and house by relocating the performance outside of the theatre space. And also, the performance further challenged definitions by further abolishing the barrier between performers and spectators by constructing the performance around the spectators and putting them at the very epicenter of the performance because it took place around us with a trait. And therefore the audience was both the subject and the object of the performance. It was about us. So as a consequence, this spectatorial role is transformed from passive observant to active participant in the performance, unexpectedly. And the performance, therefore, transforms the space in which the spectator was located into a participatory performance site. So I'm going to discuss this point further by turning to the second uh, production of Shakespeare, which is by Royal de Lux. Now, Royal de Lux was founded in 1977 by Jean-Luc Courcou, and is particularly well known for its um, creation of machines and, and giant puppets. And you might remember the um, touring of the elephant uh, in London and Liverpool and Britain. Okay. So it's there, by the books. 
In 2003, under the fake name, the trestles, uh, the Treto de Ministrel, the trestles of the minstrels, they presented the free 45 minute long comedy sale, two shows for the price of one. A simultaneous of the two theatre classics, um, the, the Maladie Imaginaire, the Imaginary Invalid by Molière, and Hamlet by Shakespeare. Yes, I know it's not a comedy, but actually it was. And stage on a turntable, which, which gets stuck and goes all right. And the play was performed on market squares in France, Chile, and Spain until 2005. From the outset, the play revolved around the theme of precariousness. I'm sorry about the quality of the uh, of the picture, but you can see you can you, you, you can see the props and you can see the turntable. So the dressing rooms were empty campsite tents. There was a firefighter, obviously for health and safety reasons, and he was drunk, or he appeared drunk. The sound engineer was deaf and only spoke Serbian. A machinist shouted <laughs> out, <laughs> not not ideal. A machine is shouted at trade union propaganda, and Julie, the stage manager, went around in a suspender belt and spent most of the performance arguing loudly with one of the clowns. The performance began with an announcement on loudspeakers We're waiting for the technicians, without them, we can't do anything. Jean Luc is stuck in Nantes with one of the lorries that has the material, so Jean Luc, what, what shall we do? Shall we cancel? So the thousand odd spectators shouted out, Woo, renforcé, we want our money back. But the performance was free, I just bear that in mind. <laughs> uh, so as half of the stage set was declared to be missing, the director decides that the performance will be on sale. So we'll have two plays performed for free, with only half of each play being performed uh, using the revolving turntable. As the engine for the turntable is also missing, the stage was activated thanks to an old-fashioned moped, which you can see here, <laughs> and a sewing machine, and then began to spin non-stop. <laughs> and then there was yet another announcement saying, we've got a problem with the death of the king in Hamlet, we haven't got the king. Okay. <laughs> so the firefighter here stepped in. Okay. So in the wings, in full view of the audience, with full sound effects, Hamlet tried to stop Gertrude from getting too drunk. And when the wings caught fire, the firefighter used a fire extinguisher on the audience. And as you can see here, they loved it. And at the end of the play, the actors organized a raffle and gave the entire receipts to a member of the audience. So, as I'm sure is clear, the performance bore no resemblance with Hamlet or Shakespeare theatre whatsoever. The aim of the production, according to Jean-Luc Courcourt, was to confront the audience with the difficulties of putting together a performance and reflecting on the boundaries between spectators and performers. Royal Deluxe's production initially took place in 2003 during the strike of the intermittent du spectacle, workers employed in the entertainment industry on short-term contracts. The audience was able to draw obvious parallels with the precarious nature of the profession itself, made worse at the time by contractual changes. A broader reflection follows on the economic and political systems that, in France, cultivate high cultural icons symbolized especially by Shakespeare and Molière, whose success is dependent on a workforce that is socially marginalized. The reflection, therefore, is not on Shakespeare's place, but on the place of Shakespeare's place in French culture and society. And whereas Much Ado was built around the unsuspected public, unsuspecting public, in uh, uh, sales, the audience was invited to enter a clearly demarcated performance space. However, it is my impression that both productions succeeded in placing the audience in the middle of the action and at the center of a form of installation art. Claire Bishop states that installation art creates a situation into which the viewer physically enters and insists that you regard this as a singular totality, rather than imagining the viewer as a pair of disembodied eyes that survey the work from a distance. Installation art presupposes an embodied viewer whose senses of touch, smell, and sound are as heightened as their sense of vision. 
So this means that individuals unexpectedly become active audience participants and, as for much ado, actors in the play. Now, in sales here, a third of the way through sales, a member of the audience was heard to say, has it begun yet? And there was clear dislocation where boundaries were concerned. And this was further illustrated at the beginning of the play by the collapse of the makeshift stage curtain, which was made up of a house of cards. So, Royal Deluxe and Vinci Micouvert transformed the familiar function of everyday spaces, such as car parks, market squares, into spaces where people's certainties were challenged. They reminded us that the street, the car park, the market square, the theatre are never neutral spaces because they are defined by having specific functions and boundaries. They're structured by power relationships and the same power relationships that structure our everyday lives. People normally use car parks and theatres for very specific purposes. I park my car there or I go to the theatre. It would occur to me to have a picnic in the car park. And their users also share characteristics defining memberships of the group. If I don't own a car or travel in a car, I'm, it's very unlikely that I'm going to take a stroll through a car park unless we can take a shortcut. But again, we're talking about traveling here. Um, and as we know, people who go and see Shakespeare in the theater, we all know if it's a traditional theater, we all know that they share a common cultural capital. Let's not delude ourselves. So, in short, everyday spaces obey the rules of inclusion and exclusion that structure Shakespeare's comedies. Therefore, blurring these boundaries surely draws attention to the social, socio-political conditions that define the meaning of these familiar sites and cause the audience to experience them differently. So, in my introduction, I said that my aim was to ask whether the disruption of, of everyday everyday space is able to encourage a different kind of civic participation. This question takes me back to Henri Lefebvre's critique of power relations. For Lefebvre, everyday life was the place where alienation and mystification was played out and enacted. It was also, therefore, the place where the struggles to erase alienation and achieve a so-called true liberation must be located. It's also important to stress Lefebvre's insistence that in this re-evaluation of social space, the right to participatory citizenship and the right to difference are not defined abstractly, but arise through sharing space and social exchange. They are therefore specialized in concrete physical ways, thus radically redefining processes of inclusion and marginalization. So to conclude, it's my belief that the two uh, productions and the two companies I've examined have performed sophisticated comedies based on the principle of Shakespearean comedy and born out of Lefebvre's utopian aim to propose a re-evaluation of social space by spatially reflecting on the process of inclusion and exclusion. And by doing so, they ask important political questions, including basic questions such as what constitutes a theatrical performance, what makes a, the uh, a theatre audience, where does Shakespeare theatre belong, uh, belong? What defines genre? But also, to go back to the first slide I had, what, why do we do what we do, when and where we do it? And more, fun more fundamentally, by exposing every everyday city space as performative space, their work may open up a space for political engagement in the public realm. Disrupting familiar categories encourages everybody to participate in the community without having to claim formal membership. So by shaping the stability of the everyday world, Shakespearean comedy in this state challenges our perceptions about society, sorry, about the, the nature of antagonism and the nature of relationships in the city. Now, I don't think that in this current state, this is ever likely to change the world or change society. But I would still argue that it constitutes a form of political theatre in the sense that it interrogates notions of belonging and alienation and what creates differences, leading towards, in Valibar's world, words, a displacement within the very idea of social relations. Thank you very much.
Thank you very much, Nicole. And moving on to our final speaker, um, Anne-Sophie Hervescu. Uh, Anne-Sophie is a PhD student in the Department of Aesthetics, Communication and English at Aarhus University. And her research interests include acting techniques and body language in Shakespearean performance, the cultural history of the emotions, and intercultural and global Shakespeare, which is presumably what brings her here. <laughs> um, she has recently interviewed Stanley Wells on Shakespeare globalization and the digital revolution for New Theatre Quarterly, and has also published an essay on transcultural theatre and Peter Brook's essentialist aesthetic in transnational literature. And her paper title today is Words, Bodies, and Laughter, Performing Shakespeare's Sonnets to a Local Audience. Um, we had a very interesting question this morning um, about laughter, actually, which I was very excited about, um, because I think it opened up for a discussion about the ambiguities of laughter and also in some way called for an awareness of um, the distinction between different kinds of laughter, um, some of which I like to talk about in my paper, laughter as perhaps rebellious or subversive or transgressive, but also laughter as um, disciplinary or, or even sort of reinforcing authority rather than transgressing it. So I hope I can try and contribute a bit to that discussion within the space of 15 minutes um, in relation to Shakespearean adaptation and notions of shared, or rather perhaps not shared, local humour. Um, and as is often the case with discussions, black is probably not going to be very funny, um, but it will perhaps be uneasy, even even sinister, but I, I don't think that. Um, I'm going to talk about Danish production of Shakespeare's sonnets and adaptations. And this I have my paper as well as bodies and laughter. Um, sonnets, sonnetta, the Danish title of this, production was an adaptation of 17 of Shakespeare's sonnets for the experimental stage the or the Red Room at the Royal Danish Shakespeare at the Royal Danish Theatre in Copenhagen Shakespeare sort of seems to want you. Um, the selected sonnets were translated into Danish by Miss Ponson who is in our midst and the production was directed by the young female director Elisa Kaul. So the dramaturgy of the production um, resemble that of a concert, where each of the 17 sonnets was staged as an individual narrative um, by some or all of the five actors, two male and three female. There was, a, there was no attempt to create a coherent overall storyline, but rather to produce rapidly shifting impressions of the many tensions and contradictions within and between the sonnets themselves. The emphasis in the production was on the nature of multiple manifestations of love, um, sometimes as tenderly innocent, other times as explicitly erotic or directly violent. The words, translated words, were spoken, sung, screamed, and above all, embodied. They were translated into physical action and especially interaction. The first scene explicitly, the first scene of the production, explicitly, this is not a picture of it, I'm sorry, I don't have a picture of that. The person explicitly acknowledged the textual source um, by showing a large wide board on the stage, like a magnified page of the book on which Ms. Bonds' translation of sonnet number 15 was printed. The last word of that sonnet, um, are, I engraft you new. The poet gives new or eternal life to decaying body parts. The production here you know, picked up on that cue, but reversed it. So here, bodies re-engrafted the written text by transposing it into the powerfully present reality of the flesh. So after the board was carried off stage, words became sort of, sort of almost a kind of love potion or drug ingested and absorbed by the actors and affecting their bodies in erotic, tragic, comic, and sometimes very disturbing ways, as demonstrated in several little ways during the production. So I'm going to show you first there. So, um, one of the early scenes in the production, three female actors came on stage and performed a kind of almost sort of trance-like session in which they seemed to be suggesting that they were either taking a drug or just being very strongly physically affected. And the second picture shows a later scene in which a pomegranate was squeezed rather violently into the mouth of some of the actors. So this idea of, of embodying, ingesting, absorbing something is very strong. 
um, and it also comes across in the trailer of the production, which I'm just going to show you, just to sort of give a sense of, of what was going on. I know it's not very easy, but hopefully it will work. productions in Denmark in recent decades. It had several sold-out reruns since um, 2012 with both the director and the translator received much praise um, from critics in the Danish press. However, the reason I want to talk about the production is not because of critical acclaim, nor will I presume to talk about the process of translating the sonnets. I'm sure Niels can enlighten you on that himself. Um, my reason for analysing this particular production in the context of this symposium is because it made audiences, audiences laugh. Um, and it is a laughter, or some of the kinds of laughter that I, can, that I believe can be related to certain dynamics of adapting and performing Shakespeare translation for and with local audiences. I'm also going to try to turn very briefly to the slippery term local. So my very condensed engagement with the complexities of laughter here draws on Michael Billick's critique of positive humour and discussion of laughter and ridicule from 2005. Rather than assuming that human laughter are always inherently positive, Billy takes up their darker mechanisms, particularly in the form of ridicule and social exclusion. I'm very grateful um, to Nicole for talking about inclusion and exclusion because that will certainly come up here. Um, one of the paradoxes in his extensive account of laughter is that it is both social and antisocial. Laughter, Billy Wright writes, um, can bring people together in a bond of enjoyment and by mockery it can exclude, exclude people. Paradox, which of course is familiar to most people, can be applied to moments of Carol's production in which laughter became implicated in games of both inclusion and exclusion of the speaking eye of the text. Now, often these games consisted in the actors challenging or subverting the spoken words with very explicit body language and thus offering the audience a sort of tension between verbal and visual discourse which was responded to with laughter. I'll give an explicit example of this further on. Therefore, in certain moments of the performance, who or what was excluded by laughter was Shakespeare, insofar as Shakespeare can be said to be represented by a reference to an author or a lie, which is perhaps, of course, not very far. But in laughing at Shakespeare's eyes, a particular we emerged in relations between the stage and the auditorium. And this we, I think, can be related to tensions often encountered in Shakespearean adaptations, tensions between paying homage to the cultural capital represented by Shakespeare, using it to fill the theatre, and challenging it at the same time. So in the context of translating and adapting Shakespeare for a local audience, such tensions become, not surprisingly, even more pertinent. Um, as Sonia Masai, another show in the book Worldwide Shakespeare's from 2005, the term local, is defined in numerous and ambiguous ways. To be local, in my brief analysis, it could simply mean to have certain shared cultural traits that enable you to laugh at someone who is not. On the other hand, in this production, Shakespeare was not just laughed at. His text 
was also being used to laugh at others with, and he was thus included by the exclusion of someone else. Now, this was seen, for example, um, in the performance of the well-known sonnet number 113, My Mistress Eyes Are Nothing Like the Sun, number 130, sorry. Um, one of the male actors performed this sonnet as a wedding speech by a very nervous young groom to, um, <laughs> to, to his increasingly bemused bride, played by one of the female actors. But significantly, he performed this wedding speech in a very recognisable regional Danish accent or dialect, which again invoked a particular Danish stereotype of a sort of stout and simple-minded country lad who would not contaminate his lovemaking with fancy compliment, and who would possibly also be unlikely to attend a performance at the Royal Theatre in Copenhagen, let alone a performance with Shakespeare in the title. And of course, the audience in that performance laughed at this, so someone else was excluded via Shakespeare. Thus, these sort of games of inclusive and exclusive laughter shifted throughout the performance. And the central notion was that nobody was safe, least of all the audience, who were confronted with their own laughing image by the set design, consisting um, of a series of, of these mirrors. And it's perhaps not easy to see, but actually the audience was sort of reflected in a very distorted way in, in this set design. Now the Red Room, this experimental stage at the Royal um, Danish Theatre, defines itself as, a, as, as, a, as an experimental performance space and involves a group of artists, including actors and directors, who have agreed on a series of manifesto-like aesthetic games. They want to produce classical and contemporary drama in extreme physical, I would say visceral, perhaps, as we've just seen, uh, ways. They want to challenge the formers of the theatre, the physical and emotional abilities of the actor, as well as the responsiveness of the audience. Now, actors in this production consistently broke the fourth wall through direct address involving the audience in, in the meaning making process. Again, a little trick that caused laughter in several ways. The second sonnet performed on stage was number 18, shall I compare thee? Which was recited by one of the male actors in a way that staged the audience as the actor scene. And as if the difficult process of making sense of these complex images and metaphors took place in dialogue with the audience. Um, the actor used repetition, pauses, and especially body language to create a kind of tongue-in-cheek complicity that suggested he was also sharing the audience's first encounter with the intricacies of the language. Sometimes his expressions seem to imply something like, well, oh, this is really deep stuff, I'm not sure I can get my head around it, can you? of course, again, was rewarded with laughter. So the delivery, again, sort of implied that meaning is not inherent in the text, but established in the encounter between the speaker and the other scene. And I found that this actually resonated with um, Mills Bonds' translation of particularly the last line of that sonnet. Feel free to contest this notes. Um, the last line of the sonnet, so long lives this, and this gives life to thee. And Shakespeare's poem gives life to the other scene. But Mills' translation might actually suggest the reverse. The epic sees who or what gives life gives life to the poem, which I found a very very interesting cue for this production. A Danish critic wrote in a review of the production that the sonnet format normally signals something neat or prim, but that the bodies in on the stage in Carl's production exposed hypocrisy camouflaged by language. Now I don't believe that it's quite as simple as that. Neither Shakespeare's sonnets nor in this production. But it's certainly true that bodies and words clashed powerfully at key points, and that, again, was a very strong cause for laughter. Now, to confront poetic metaphors with the very tangible su substance in human bodies can be said to um, contain inherent comic potential, I think. Just imagine somebody with a very, very severe cold reciting, shall I compare the two songs today? It's a pretty good example. Um, and of course, sonnet number 130 is itself an excellent example of this. So by including this sonnet, the production took an important cue from that example. Now the next um, and the last example that I want to look at is the interpretation of sonnet number 109. I'll never say that I was false of heart. Um, this confrontation between words and bodies was, I think, at its most explicit, and the comedy effect was very obvious. Now this is a sonnet um, that has already been accused of protesting too much um, recently by Don Patterson and the production explored this 
to the full um, this notion of the summit as a nicely sort of prepared set of excuses. Um, as in the other examples that I mentioned before, the audience was again staged as the addressee by one of the male actors as he began speaking. And as he began speaking, he was climbing down a set very athletic way, um, which suggested a kind of superiority and easy physical control, which he, however, lost as soon as he was distracted by one of the female actors, and you see sort of lying there um, on the floor. And um, he was also distracted by several of the female actors. In fact, they all appeared on stage one by one. And as this happened, he began to have very explicit interaction with them. And this, in turn, broke his interaction with the words of the sonnet to the point of his losing control over meaning and structure. So this is what happened next. But even while doing so, he still attempted to convince the audience of his sincerity in a very insincere way, which caused, again, a great deal of laughter. He was trying to flirt with the audience at the same time, so there were sort of several layers of contradiction and tension going on here. Um, eventually, his words, the words of the sonnet, disintegrated into animal sounds. I think I heard a sheep um, bleating at some point, and then, then the other actors began to repeat that. So words sort of just in, disintegrated um, into something that wasn't really quite intelligible. But with that sound, I thought that he showed a particular way of not just mocking the text, but also mocking himself and mocking the audience all at the same time. Um, to return to um, Sonia Masai's book, um, I just wanted to mention a chapter contained by this book by Tobias Dürring, um, in which he discusses adaptation in terms of both remembering and dismembering the literary script, which I think is a very useful term, um, especially in, in terms of thinking about examples such as this one, and the ways in which this particular production engrafted Shakespeare's sonnets new through embodied action. Because the text was literally remembered, because the words were reconstructed by bodies in physical action. And at the same time, it was clearly dismembered, because the same bodies were tearing apart formal structures and subverting the meanings of the words by contrasting behavior. Now, both acts provoke laughter. Laughter that either included or excluded um, someone or everyone. And this showed, again, I think, a very dynamic tension between adopting, not just adapting Shakespeare into a local context and resisting him at the same time, whatever he might be. I think that's a difficult thing to define in this case. So in concluding, beginning to conclude this, this brief analysis, I also want to stress that such adaptation is not merely sort of characterized by kind of willful bar bashing. It's, um, it shows how the, the local we that was created during this particular performance, this local we laughing at Shakespeare's eye, was at the same time made to laugh at itself in this indistinct mirror of bodies and words, which, again, this constant shift, which was very hard to grasp in the performance, between who laughs at whom or what, and what laughs back at you, um, helps to break down notions of the Shakespearean text as passive and instead reinforces its active and flexible role in the process of adaptation. <laughs>